morning. Let's stand.
just bow at his feet Oh, he has done great things See what our Savior has done See how his love overcomes Cause he has done great things Believe that? He has done great things Sunday morning. My name is Ashley and I have just a few announcements for you. If it's your first time with us this morning, we're so glad to have you here. If you would stop by our welcome desk on the way out after service, we would love to be able to meet you, connect with you, and we have just a small gift for you. If you're joining us in service this morning, if you would take out your cell phone and scan the QR code on the pew in front of you, that's going to take you directly to our online connect card. If you would fill that out so we know that you are here with us this morning. And if you are at home, just go to Galilee.org and you'll find our Connect card on our homepage there. 
We have a few ways for you to give to Galilee today. If you're in person, you can just drop it in the offering box in our foyer, or you can go to galilee.org and click on the Give tab. You can also text Galilee CC to 77977 to give directly from your phone. We have lots of ways for you to serve here at Galilee, but right now our media production team is in need of some volunteers. If you would email Kai at the email below, he'll be able to get you set up as soon as possible. Last this morning, summer is almost here, and Galilee Kids and Galilee Student Ministries have already released their summer calendars. We also have some Galilee family events planned for this summer, so make sure you head over to galilee.org and click on events, or you can text Galilee app to 77977 and find all of our events there. That's all for the announcements this morning, and we hope you have a beautiful day and a wonderful week. Moving forward 
that's what this is about. I mean, digging into this story of Esther is about us understanding God's word and figuring out how does this apply to me? What do I do with this information I've been given? 
about this woman who stepped up, who was there for such a time as this, as we're going to hear more about next week. But she was used by God, she and Mordecai, used by God to make a difference, to stand up and to follow the ways of the one true God that they served. And that's really where the application is there for you and me today. What are we doing with the opportunities that we've been given to serve God, to step up and show the ways of our king over the ways of worldly kings? worldly powers, worldly expectations. That group of people, people that are obeying the world, listening to the world, following worldly leaders as their ultimate sources of authority, they are expected to respond in a particular way. Those of you, like me, and and many others of you, both here in person and online, you are following Jesus, King Jesus. And so the expectation is then that you are going to live out those principles that you say you believe about him. It's gonna show up in your behavior. It's gonna show up in the critical moments when God has put you in a place for such a time as this. What are you gonna do with it? The truth is some days we get it right and some days we get it wrong. Recently, I got it wrong. I was going to Dairy Queen, most everyone knows the Dairy Queen here in Jefferson, and I was going there to pick up a cake for uh, one of my kids for their birthday. And so I was parking my car, if you know how the the store works, there's like the drive through and and as it was to that day, it was pushed back pretty far out into the parking lot. So I parked over to the right and I was gonna walk across the parking lot and into uh, the store to go buy the cake I needed. So I start to walk and I I notice a truck pulls in front of me, which was fine. I mean, he was just going and looked like he was going into the drive through no big deal. So I let him pass and I started to go. And there was a parking space that was open that I just happened to be walking through because that was the direction to go to the front door, right? And it's what anybody would do. All of a sudden, I, I kind of look out of the corner of my eye and I see this guy slamming it into reverse and he is backing in to this spot where I'm like making my way. I'm not even quite there yet, but he's literally about to plow me over and he's going, I mean, it, he, was, he was pretty good at backing up because he did this at like 10 miles an hour. I feel like he was rolling on his backing up. And so I just kind of freeze, right? And I'm just kind of standing there and he never sees me at any point. He just backs up into the spot. I'm standing like four feet from his truck. Must have been in a blind spot or something. He never saw me. So I'm just kind of standing like this. And I couldn't help but look over to the side and I see the people that are sitting outside. You know, they're eating at Dairy Queen. They're sitting outside. And they saw this whole thing happen. So suddenly I've got some people on my team. (laughs) I look over at them because again, I couldn't help it. And they're looking at me just like shaking their head. And they're right with me on this, like, what an idiot. And there I was like, I know, this guy, what's he doing? I didn't say anything. I didn't really do anything. I didn't actually do that hand motion, but I just went, kind of gave it one of those looks, like, good gracious. Well, the guy parks, and as I'm finally kind of walking around his truck to go, he's like, oh, sorry, I didn't see. And I was like, "Eh, no problem. I don't even know what I said. I just waved. I didn't say anything bad. I just waved. Don't worry. I didn't say anything bad. Just wave and walk. And then it hit me. I was wearing the shirt, Galilee Christian Church, across my t-shirt. That was the t-shirt I happened to have on that day. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh man, I could have handled that better. I I didn't handle that very well. Now you might be like, oh yeah, it doesn't sound like you did anything that crazy. And I didn't, I've probably done worse. But that day, I didn't do anything that crazy according to the world's standards. Because, you know, the people that were watching, they were there with me. They've had somebody do something dumb while they're driving, and they're just right there with me, and I'm right there with them. But could I have handled that in a more Christ-like fashion? Yes. Would the standard that I, would, would what I did rise to the standard of the world and the world say, yeah, no big deal. No big deal the way you handled that. Anybody would have done that. Yeah. The world would say, that's totally cool. Yeah, I mean, you, were, you seemed like you handled it pretty reasonably. But I don't want to be held to the world's standard. I don't want to obey the standards of worldly kings and powers. I want to obey my King Jesus. And I want to look in opportunities like that when I can love somebody radically and when I can take up a Christ-like attitude that will be different than what the world does. That's how I want to react. 
And that day, I didn't quite pass the test, just like you have and I have many other days of our lives. But this series is all about looking at this story of someone that stands up, does what's right, and overcomes the ways of the world. And God is orchestrating the whole thing, even though, like I told you last week, he's not actually mentioned by name in the whole book of Esther. But he is all over it, y'all, and we are going to see that. All right, let me catch you up in the story. If you read ahead, that's excellent, because you, you've already covered something we're not really covering in our main text today that's going to begin in Esther chapter 3. At this point, Mordecai has already, remember, if you remember the characters, King Xerxes is the big bad king over Persia, basically the ruler over most of the known world. We're about to meet Haman. He's the other main bad guy. And then we have Esther again. She's now queen and Mordecai, who is her adoptive dad. Okay, so hopefully you're caught up in the story to some degree, even if you haven't read the whole thing. But Mordecai and Esther, of course, are Jews. And, you know, the Jewish people are not well loved. We're going to get into that. But Mordecai overhears these two guards at the gate at the end of chapter 2 in Esther. And they are plotting to assassinate the king. When he hears this, he takes it to Esther. Esther takes it to the king, saves the king's life, and the two guards are executed. But where we are about to pick up in chapter 3, we've now jumped forward four years. If you read this already and you went straight from chapter 2 to chapter 3, you're like, wait a minute, Mordecai just told what was happening, uh, that the king was going to be assassinated. They saved him from assassination, and yet no reward is given to Mordecai. That's going to come later, don't worry. But it doesn't come here, and it kind of doesn't make any sense. But you got to understand that now it's like four years later, and we're getting a different piece of the story. The story has progressed. Esther has been queen now for about four years, okay? So now, I hope I've got you caught up. Look with me at Esther chapter 3. It'll be on the screen. I encourage you to open it in a Bible in front of you because it'll make some of this easier. All right, here we are. Four years later, it says, After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha. And remember, after these events are the events I just told you about, okay? The Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, and his people, of course, were the Jews, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai, which would have been a lot in and of itself, but for the time period would have been the expected worldly kings, worldly powers, expected behavior, that you would execute the person that was doing you wrong if you were in a position of power. But he wants to go far beyond that and create or commit genocide across an entire people group, okay? He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pure, that is the lot. Now, think about that as like casting dice or flipping a coin to make a decision. Okay, that's the way you can best understand what's going on here. And this may not have made any sense to you before about like, why is he doing this? Haman is actually, I mean, he believes in luck, and they believe that by casting lots like this, and sometimes it was coins, sometimes it was dice, sometimes it was sticks, it doesn't matter. They were throwing something to try to figure out what is luck saying to us that's going to tell us what to do here. He's trying to find good luck about when is the best time for us to issue this decree and execute all the Jews. That's what's happening here. So now you understand that a little, in a little bit more context, like why it's set against that. But notice 
This is set in the month of Nisan. Later, it's called the month of Adar. And those are, again, probably more details than you care about. But you should care, because here's why. The month of Nisan, this month when Haman is seeking to find a way to crush God's people. God is in that very month when, when Haman thinks he's going to get good luck to do exactly what he wants and see God's people put down. It is in that very month, it's that same month, that the Passover happened. That's the same month of Passover. And it's also the same month when Jesus Christ, whom most of us in this room serve and follow, the same month that he was crucified for the sin and the redemption of the world and ultimately became the Passover for everyone that follows him. Do you see that the author of Esther is sending us a message? Oh boy, this is critical, friends. Critical. Again, probably more details than some of you want, but you need them. Because here, the world thinks it's winning. The worldly powers, the power of earthly kings seems to be brought fully to bear. They are going to kill and wipe off the face of the earth God's people. That's the edict that is about to go out. They're only trying to find the best time to do that where they think they can make it happen. And all the while, this is happening on the month of, the, uh, of, of God's ultimate redemption for mankind. So it's, it's so critical that we set this in that context. It says that the lot fell on the 12th month, the month of Adar. So about a year later was when the lots told him he should issue this decree for to kill the Jews. Guess what that also does? God allows a year for Mordecai and Esther to plan and to stop this. God's hand is at work even when we don't see it, even when it isn't obvious. His deliverance is coming. All right, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There's a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people. They do not obey the king's laws. The king's laws. That's what we've been talking about this morning. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasuries. Like, I'll even pay for this, for them being wiped off the face of the earth. Verse 10, so the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of, Ham son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. So, his, what we would call today anti-Semitism, doesn't take much stirring up. He doesn't even want the money. He's just like, yeah, kill him. Have at it. And by the way, here's the power of my signet ring, which allows you to say whatever you want and do whatever you want. That's what's happening. Verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to kill uh, to, to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various people. They were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Bottom line is, and the rest of that text, y'all, I'm not going to read the rest of it. This goes out to all the people. And when it goes out to all the people, it actually says in the very last verse that all of Susa, and remember Susa is modern day Iran, all of that capital city, at the time it was the capital city of Persia, all of that capital city, it says they were bewildered. There's another translation that says that the city was in an uproar. Well, of course they were. Right? They've just issued this order to commit genocide. But the king and Haman, they actually sit down to drink. They sit down to party. That's the way of earthly kings. And if you're following along in the notes, that's kind of the first big idea here. And we'll go through these very quickly now. It says, you know, ultimately, they've got power. They're going to use it. They're going to crush their enemies. They're going to make sometimes poor decisions and put poor people in positions of leadership. We got to wonder, like, why does 
why does Xerxes put this guy Haman in power? I mean, why do, why do bad people get in positions of leadership anytime? I don't know. Don't have the answer to that. But one of the things we're reminded about in here is that God can work even through them, around them, and ultimately them being a part of things and still bring about his will and his plan for our world and for his people. That's important that we remember that. This would not be the first or the last time a poor leader was put in place. And, oh, by the way, King Xerxes is as big of a doofus as Haman is for putting him there, right? He just is. Putting him in this position and beginning it by saying, hey, y'all should all bow down to him. And that's a heck of a way to start, isn't it? And so, as you already read in the text here, Mordecai refuses to bow down. He just won't do it. Now, this wouldn't always be the case. I mean, we have many examples biblically that, that there would not necessarily have been anything wrong with bowing to a human leader. That did actually happen with some Jews and Hebrews. But in this particular case, he won't do it. And one of the reasons that he won't do it is because there is some deep-seated problems and issues going on here that we don't otherwise or might not otherwise fully understand. But the answers to this, the answers to what else is happening in this story that makes Haman hate Mordecai so much and Mordecai refuse to bow down so critically, why, why won't he do it? It's actually taught to us when we are introduced to both of these characters because it tells us who they are, who their parents are, what their lineage is, and all of that actually does matter in the story. It actually does. Haman's ancestor, remember Haman's the bad guy, Haman's ancestor Agag was ruler over a group of people called the Amalekites. Now, I can remember the preacher when I was in high school talking about the Amalekites, and as soon as he would start talking about them, the Amalekites and the Jebusites, I would just totally tune him out. You, you just totally lost me when you got into all these people groups that I didn't know or understand. I'm going to try to keep you with me, because I, it actually is important to the story, and it actually even has something to teach us about the modern-day conflicts that we see in Israel that are happening right now. I mean, all you got to do is watch the news, and you see that in the near Middle East, there are still deep-seated conflicts that are generational. They're generational of people being at odds, and we do not have time to get into all of that issue today. But I do want you to understand that what is happening there now is really nothing new. It is a battle that has been, is being fought for thousands of years in, in many ways. And so what happens here when we're told that Haman in his ancestry has Agag in that part of that ancestry and Agag was actually leading the Amalekites and he, as the Bible says, waylaid, it means he attacked the Israelite people when they were coming up out of slavery in Egypt. Remember, they crawled part of the Red Sea, they came across, you know the story. Well, guess who attacked them? And the Amalekites were a, they were a nomadic people, so they attacked them on the way. And God cursed them because of it. And he actually told King Saul later to wipe the Amalekites out. But King Saul didn't do that. And when King Saul didn't do, well, he, he did defeat them in battle, but he let King Agag live, and he kept some of the best spoils of the war for himself. But he had been told specifically by God, don't do it. And Saul did it anyway because he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm king. I can do what I want. And boy, was he wrong, because Samuel, who was the prophet, ultimately told him, now you're basically losing the blessing of God, and you will no longer be king. And oh, by the way, bring me Agag, and Samuel executed him himself. Took care of what Saul wouldn't do. So that's the history of the Amalekites. They were defeated, again, like I told you, by Saul, but Agag, the king, was ultimately killed by Samuel. Okay, so what's that got to do with Mordecai? Well, guess what? Guess what tribe Mordecai is of? Well, he is of the tribe of Benjamin. 
Guess who's of the tribe of Benjamin? King Saul. So you have a deep-seated battle that has been going on generationally, thousands of years. And, and in that context, it's coming up and it's, it's right there. They hated each other because generations and generations and generations, they did not like each other. And so Haman, who's in a position of power over somebody he doesn't like, is going to take up power against him and try to crush him. And that's exactly what he tries to do. But this is a reminder to us that we not give in to the ways of the world, worldly powers, worldly kings, and we not think that it's okay to hold power over anyone in an inappropriate way. If God puts you in a position of influence and of power, you tread lightly, friend. You be careful. Watch yourself lest you stumble and become like a worldly king rather than your king. This is a reminder for us. There is so much practical truth for us. And that's really the second big idea, that we'll just follow the way of the king, our King Jesus. And the good news is that the differences that Haman actually wants to exploit against Mordecai and ultimately Esther, they're going to actually turn the things that he wants to exploit against them, they're going to turn them back on Haman. What do they do? Man, Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ashes, which was just a way of being in repentance. Esther and her attendants are going to fast. They're going to pray. Long story short, they're going to turn to God and trust their king to deliver them. They're going to believe that their king is greater than his king, King Xerxes, earthly power. They're going to trust God when things get most difficult. So too for us, my friends, when you and I will commit in that same way to pray, to read the word of God, to trust him when things around us seem crazy, when we will honor Jesus in our personal and our public lives, when we will give witness to him, yes, even at Dairy Queen, even in ways that we might not think will make much difference, we'll overcome our fleshly nature. Boy, that makes a difference in this world. When when young people, when you pray through a problem that you're having with a friend at school, that honors God, that honors the king. When you go out of your way, friends, to ask for help, ask, to, ask for help from God to love your neighbor, even when your neighbor is not being very lovable. Sometimes that's literally like your next door neighbor. I had friends here at Galilee, and they would come and give me reports periodically about their neighbors who had been really bad neighbors. They'd been really terrible neighbors and they'd made them so mad that they had to like pray, God, give me peace, give me patience about this. Help me love them even when they're being so unlovable. I'm talking about like super duper trashy yard, loud music, just being really, really difficult as neighbors. But they just started praying and asking God, God, give us the strength to love that family well, even when they're being unlovable. That, I, I heard updates from them for years about this situation. Years! They loved this family when they were unlovable. Until eventually I stopped hearing updates. I finally had to go back to them and say, what, what happened? <laughs> What's the resolution? I thought they were going to be like, well, they moved or they died. I don't know. No. They said that, you know, the situation got better. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, right? This is how this can work. If we'll follow the ways of our king, we believe that God can intervene. At least we should. That's what Mordecai, that's what Esther believed. When you reach out, friends, to rebuild a relationship that you didn't break, that shows the king you serve. Hey, I've told you all this before, but did you know that in your disagreements, with other people, did you know that the most mature person moves first? Who's more mature? You are the person you're at odds with. 
I think I know how you want to answer that. But the most mature person moves first. When you do that, when you honor God in those relationships, and you're following the ways of the king. All right, last bit of this, and I'm going to try to bring this home, just trying to help us all put this in context. And what do we do with what we're learning about this biblical story more than learning about these, these names that are sometimes lost on us and, you know, Haman and Mordecai and Esther. I mean, who are these people? The Amalekites. All this matters. If you want to put this into place, you want to follow the ways of the king rather than worldly kings, you just be radically pro-life. You just honor life in every way because that's what God does versus what the worldly powers do. I mean, the anti-Semitism in this story is so strong and we think, oh man, that was awful. They were, gonna, they were gonna execute them all. And of course, we saw that in Nazi Germany. We've seen it in other ways through the years. And yes, we have saw it even like three years ago when the Tree of Life synagogue in the Pittsburgh area was attacked. 12 people dead. Terrible. All Jewish people, this synagogue attacked. And thankfully, Christians didn't sit on the sideline while that happened. They actually rose to the occasion. The other, other Christian churches and other people, other religious groups too, rose to the occasion and, and tried to help raise money and did these kinds of things to support them. We should be the kind of people that fight and value life, fight for and value life, even if those in power won't. So we're not going to be accepting of any kind of racism, anti-Semitism or any kind of racism, period. I, I've never gotten racism. I don't get it. Hating people that look differently than you, it, it makes no sense to me. And, and if we call ourselves a Christian and we have racism in our heart, man, what are you thinking about? Because one day, I, do, do you actually believe in God? Do you believe that heaven exists? If you do, how can you be racist? Because one day, your mansion's going to be next to somebody else's that probably doesn't look like you either. And, and that's, if, that's if you really know Jesus. That's if you repent of the sin of, of racism. That, that's one of the ways we can put this into place. We're just going to be radically pro-life in every single way. And yes, when I say radically pro-life, I'm talking about battling against abortion too. We cannot, cannot stomach it. We got to care for humans from the, from the womb to the tomb, from the cradle to the grave. We value and honor life. You want to put these things that we're learning about today in practice? These then become things that we care about. We care about what, God's, what God cares about, and God cares about his children, all of them. So that ought to be our heart. Not, not only being anti-abortion, but actively pro-life in every way. When you can grasp this, when this can become your attitude, well, that's when you really begin to get God's grace. When you can apply this kind of grace to other people, it means that you're really understanding grace and how God has applied it to your own life. You start to stand up for other people that need it. You start to go to battle for them in all the best ways. There's a great story told in one of my favorite authors in his book. Um, it's, uh, it's called David and Goliath. It's written by Malcolm Gladwell. And Gladwell tells the story uh, of this remarkable story. It's, a, it's of a little city in France, Les Chambons sur Lyon. Don't, uh, I've got to work on my French pronunciations, but that, I think that's how it's said. It's a small town in, uh, in south central France. And it's estimated that four or 5,000 Jews were successfully protected there during the Nazi occupation. That's a pretty significant number, especially in that region. And most of them were kids. They were children. The town's population was mostly French Protestant, and they themselves had faced a lot of persecution as well. So they really had the heart of God in wanting to stand up for the downtrodden and being standing up for people that needed help. So they just had a heart for this. They actually believed in doing and following Christ's command to love your neighbor as yourself. 
to treat somebody else, following the golden rule, how you'd want to be treated. They believed it and they lived it out. And and Gladwell tells us in his book, he says, uh, at one point in 1942, these representatives of the French government that, remember now, at this point, representatives from the French government are under Nazi control. So they show up at this town and they're assessing the situation. And yes, they're trying to ferret out Jews for the Nazis. They're out there doing the Nazis' bidding. The townspeople immediately resist this. And that day, the culmination of that day, was the reading of a statement from the town read by the children of the town to these French representatives. And here's what they said. I'm going to read it to you. It's so good. We feel obliged to tell you that there are among us a number of Jews. They just tell it, just lay it right out there. Yeah, we got, there's Jews here. But we make no distinction between Jews and non-Jews. It is contrary to gospel teaching. If our comrades, whose only fault is to be born into another religion, receive the order to let themselves be deported or even examined, they would disobey the order received. And we would try to hide them as best we could. They finished the letter by saying, we have Jews and you're not getting them. That's good stuff. That's a great attitude. I love it. As people of faith, we ought to adopt that attitude. What if we just decided right now, we're going to say to Satan, Satan, there are people that are dying outside of a relationship with Christ and they're going to hell and we won't have it. There are lost souls and you can't have them. So we're going to tell people about Jesus. We're going to proclaim the gospel from a gospel heart like these kids, like this town. that says we care about God who you care about. We value and we honor life. We care about our neighbor. And we believe that we need to do what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40. He said, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it for me. That's what happens when we love people. We just have to stand up. We have to do what's right in the sight of our king, not worldly kings. There is always an expectation of the world and of worldly kings that you would do a particular thing. Like I told you with my Dairy Queen story, right? Most people hear that story, they think, man, you didn't really handle it all that badly. No no big deal. But like I told you, I don't don't want to be held to the world's standard. The world would say that's okay, and I believe my King Jesus would say, you can do better. My friend, Dr. Freddie, he, he's had a successful medical practice in Tennessee for many, many, many years, and he recently retired. Before he retired, though, for like the last 20 years, Dr. Freddie has gone down at least once a year to our mission in Mexico, Beth Shan, Mexico mission. And every year he goes down, also has a friend that's a dentist, goes down every year with him, and they put on these clinics. Most of you guys have heard us talk about these clinics before. They will go down, and for at least a week, sometimes two weeks, I think it's actually usually two weeks, they will go down and just love the Mexican people by taking care of these physical needs in a place where it's hard, especially out where Beth Sheehan is, to get medical care. And through the years, our mission has been building a medical clinic. It's quite a significant medical clinic. The problem is we don't have a doctor for it. Pray about that. We don't have a doctor for it. Dr. Freddy, as he's retired now, and again, very successful medical practice. I'm sure that he has plenty of money, and he would do then... Well, you would expect what the world would expect him to do. What do you do? I don't know. You retire and go to the beach or go to the mountains or, you know, you chill. It's retirement time. It's awesome. Everybody say, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, Dr. Freddie just decided he and his wife that they are moving down. They now have moved down to the Bessian Mexico mission and they are living there on site And he's the doctor. Now, I said pray about another doctor because we need a doctor, a Mexican doctor, to be a part of that as well. It's regulation stuff. It's still needed. 
But he's there now, and he's working, and working to get the clinic fully up and running, and is going to live there. Now, the world would look at that and say, that's crazy. Why would you move to a dangerous place like that, where the cartel could come at any point, kill you, shut down your operation, do whatever they want, and that could happen. And he know, believe me, he knows that. But see, he counted the cost. He counted differently than the world counts. He knows what his king is telling him to do. And he doesn't care what the world thinks about it. And that's the kind of call that's on our life. That we would not succumb to the pressures of the world or worldly ways, but that we would be different. And that when we live differently, it'll make a difference. When we live for our king rather than earthly kings, it can change everything. So my prayer for you and me today is that we will stand up for life that we will care deeply about those who need to come to know our King Jesus and that we would be okay with going against the ways of the world. Let's just be okay with it. Because when we honor God above all earthly powers, the truth is we will inevitably find our way ourselves at odds with the ways of the world. And that is okay. Let them think you're crazy. But just let them think you're crazy for Jesus, friends, and it'll be all right. You trust him. God's hands are on all of it. Just like in this book of Esther. You may not hear him mentioned by name, but he is all over it. Reminding them and us, he is with them. He will not leave them. He will not forsake them or you and me. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your reminders to us today in this powerful book about who you are, about your nature, how you are different than the kings of this world. Lord Jesus, we today proclaim you king in our lives, king over our lives. As we get ready to partake together in communion, we are celebrating, Jesus, that you are our king, that you have given us everything that we need, that you have paid the ultimate price to be our king, that you've shown us how much you value our lives, and you've called us to live out that kind of faith. It's modeled on the way you loved us to love others radically when it's hard, love others when they're not being very lovable. As Jesus, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. I pray that as we commune with you now, that you'll just open up our hearts and minds, forgive us our sin, help us not take this moment for granted, but Lord Jesus, really trust you, really know how good you are, really believe that you're in control, And that you are powerful enough to take our sin away. You gave your life to prove it. We ask these things in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Let's just take a minute, be still before the Lord. Let's get ready to commune with the Lord. Just be still. partake together church first of the bread reminds us of his body given for us suffering for us on the cross and the juice that reminds us of his blood that was shed for us to cover our sins to make us new and that we might follow the ways of the one true king and know that he alone is the one that brings salvation to us. I want to thank you for being at Galilee today, and we're going to do 
Uh, just give you an opportunity to respond a little bit differently than we usually would on a Sunday morning. I'm going to be out in the foyer. <clears throat> if we can walk with you through kind of where you are with Jesus or you have questions or you're wrestling with some things, I'll be there. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to meet you and just have a conversation with you. If you've been here forever, I'd love to sit down. If this is your first time, I'd love to talk. Whatever might be going on with you, I'm here. I uh, would love to pray and, and walk with you through that. But I'm going to ask you to, to stand. We're going to pray together and we'll be dismissed from here. Let's be standing. God, I pray that today if there is even one that needs to come and to talk, Lord, to walk with and through where they are with you, Jesus, I pray that they do that. Lord, I thank you for bringing us together today in your name. We thank you for the time of worship. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word. God, to study, to grow. Lord, I pray that we will come away from today being reminded that your ways, the ways of you, O oh great King, are better than these worldly ways. We respect the earthly authorities, God. We do. But Lord, you are our ultimate authority. We follow them as you've told us to do, but never above you. Never, if anything they ask us to do, goes outside of what you've asked us to do, Jesus, because you are our King. Help us follow you in every way, in big and small ways. Find us faithful, King. We love you, Jesus. We ask your blessings over our church and all these families that have gathered. We pray all these things in your most precious and holy name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.